uh, chickens to make too. Okay, everyone, we are now live. You can begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. Um, Good morning, everyone. I'm going to call the meeting to order. I'll remind everyone to please disclose of any pecuniary interest at the appropriate time. And is Dr. Renaday on the call? Because we'll go right to his update. Good morning, Dr. Renaday. I'm going to turn the meeting over to you. Okay, great. Thank you. I'll just confirm that you can hear me. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I hope you have a little bit of time today because there's a lot of stuff going on and I need to sort of keep you updated about all of it. So um, I will just start with what we usually talk about, but there's a few things at the end I was hoping to share a screen with you and just kind of help you visualize uh, uh, some of the issues around vaccination just so that you're aware of them. Um, so just to start off with in terms of cases, so our, yesterday's outbreaks, uh, sorry, yesterday's uh, update said that we had uh, five more cases, which is five from the previous day, right? And that that data will be updated again today with yesterday's information. Uh, we did have one more uh, death that brings our total to 55 deaths over this pandemic in the county. We've had uh, 19 more recoveries, so that brings our total to 2,986 recoveries or resolutions. Um, and our total of variants of concern is right now 281. Uh, by you know, many of the cases that are coming in are screening positive as variants of concern. Uh, and just to remind you, um, you know, in general, we think that these variants are more transmissible. There's emerging evidence that one of them, the UK variant, can present with some more severe disease and also severe disease in younger age groups. Uh, still, you have to remember from the larger viewpoint that it is an increase in risk on an already small risk of, of um, severe hospitalization and death for that age group, right? So I'm going to show you that a little bit later just so you can visualize it. Um, we have uh, one institutional outbreak, one workplace outbreak, um, but in general, our numbers are coming down. The seven-day trend is downward. Um, you know, we, we get a lot of variability in day-to-day -day cases. Uh, so sometimes it's one or two or five, sometimes 10, sometimes 20, but still on the low range. And, and we're still, and the numbers are, are trending sort of downward, which is good. Um, you know, there are also new variants that are being identified just as this moves through the globe, right? They're from different countries. Um, sometimes they're identified by the country uh, that they come from, but scientifically they're identified by what mutation actually exists in them. And so the labs are, uh, you know, moving forward constantly to say, okay, which of these should we be screening for? Um, and then updating their guidance and, and their uh, information to us on what, what variants are being screened for, how those screens are done. But in principle, every positive COVID case uh, goes on to be screened for a variant. If the variant screen is positive, it goes uh, either it's reported as that it's likely to be a particular variant or it goes on for further testing to uh, verify exactly which one it is. Uh, a couple of other things that you need to be aware of. Uh, you'll note, uh, of course, um, increasing restrictions across the province in response to health system pressures. Uh, those have been put forward. Some of those things have been walked back. Some of the things around playgrounds, some of the things around uh, enforcement uh, were proposed and then pulled back. Uh, but in general, the principle that everybody is moving forward on is really trying to restrict things to their most essential. Um, although what is essential is, is up for debate and is being defined currently and redefined, right? So I'll leave that one there, but I think you're all fairly aware of what's going on there. Um, I need to tell you about health system issues and what's happening there. Again, I'm not immersed in that system, so I'm telling you about information that I get from our partners about what's happening. Um, but I think that the key point here is that um, ICUs in the GTA are filling up as our as our regular beds, right? With both COVID and non-COVID patients, but because COVID patients are also coming in, you have this influx of people who need care uh, in addition to what would normally be provided. The consequence of that is that hospitals in the GTA area are, are sending patients to other big centers, London, Windsor, et cetera. And the consequence of that is that if those places get full or, or are required to take patients and are having trouble balancing their um, bed situations, then they will redirect patients to uh, hospitals like ours. We did get a patient the other day that was redirected. I think that patient is also returning home uh, very shortly. And so like it's it's a situation that's constantly dynamic and in flux. Um, I wanna let you know about that and make you aware of it because I think 
many months ago, um, we talked about how one of the justifications for intervention is systems protection, right? And at this point, it looks like the system is in a very significant stress. And, you know, people are talking about it as being a critical emergency. And you also need to be aware that, that there is very little, according to the science tables report on Friday, that can be done to change that trajectory in the short term. So, right, because, because the, the cases of today are a result of transmission from two weeks ago, essentially whatever's coming through the system now over the next week or two is, is they're calling it baked in. That is to say there is nothing that any restriction or intervention now can do to address what's going to happen in the next two to three weeks. All the interventions that are taking place now are designed to to, to flatten that trajectory beyond the next two to three weeks to ensure that there remain beds, to ensure that there remain caregivers, et cetera. So the two health system pieces that you need to be aware of are infrastructure and human resources. So, so lots of people are talking about building field hospitals, building other kinds of setups, adding beds, et cetera. The other critical limiting factor is the human resources to actually deliver that care, right? Care is a, a result of a number of specified skill sets and you can't just sort of um, it's not necessarily a thing where you could just ask for volunteers, right? So, um, so the, those are the two critical determining factors, and you'll probably see lots of stories happening around there. Uh, what we know of our current hospital system is that it's fairly, uh, you know, the, it's, it's okay. Um, they do have some capacity. They are able to accept some patients. They're still able to maintain, uh, care to people here, except that, um, they have been required by the province to to ramp down on some elective surgeries again, which is going to create or add to the existing backlog, which will have to be tackled later, right? So just just to keep you aware of what's what's happening there, our current health system locally is okay, but under pressure from spillover effects from other regions that are under immense pressure to to deliver care. Okay, um, there was a question about asymptomatic spread. So before I go into talking about the vaccines, um, I'll just I'll just touch on that. So I did some digging to see if there was any new information on that. When last I presented to you on asymptomatic spread, it was believed that uh, you know asymptomatic disease could account for sort of twenty to thirty percent of the overall caseload. Um, there's no change in that estimate, although there's still lots of uncertainty. So um, the most recent uh, you know, nobody's willing to actually pin a number down on it. So I looked at the WHO guidance and they say that asymptomatic spread is still incredibly uncertain. Uh, we don't really know to what extent that happens, although we know it does happen. So, so two points on that, just to kind of help you with this. There are a small portion of people with disease who don't have any symptoms. There's a, there's a larger portion of people who have disease who don't have symptoms for a while, are infectious, but later go on to develop symptoms. So they're, we, we, they call, they're called pre-symptomatic, as in they will develop symptoms. They are infectious. Um, if you follow them over time, you find out that they actually do get sick, right? And that has been confusing the discussion around um, asymptomatic spread, because most of the time when you look into asymptomatic, you just say, did you have any symptoms at the time of the test, people say no, but lit a day later, they're in bed, or right. So, so the challenge is in determining what's the level of asymptomatic spread still exists. The current estimates are sort of 20 to 30 percent, but that's probably on the high side. Um, uh, just just based on kind of what we see. Um, but also, I would say the second question then is how effectively can a person with no symptoms spread disease? The answer to that question is also fairly unclear. We have had in our local experience um, lots of cases where asymptomatic cases were detected through potentially long-term care surveillance screening, etc. Uh, you know, I would say a very low proportion of those went on to cause further transmission or outbreaks from what we saw. Again, that's a small sample. It's a small population to be looking at to, to look at that data, but just that's but, but we have seen cases of asymptomatic transmission or pre-symptomatic transmission causing outbreaks in other places. So it's still an ongoing kind of question. I would say that there's no real definitive answer to that. Um, I'm hoping that I can share my screen because this is really what I wanted to show you a few things here. Just give me one second and I will see if I can do that. Can you see my screen? Okay, great. This is just a screenshot from our, our um, uh, Lambton Public Health uh, uh, data site on COVID. Uh, just to show you the real thing that I wanted to highlight for you is this line that cuts through the bars. And the line is a, um, 
is a seven day average. And so you can see that heading into late March, our seven day, oops, sorry our seven day averages are trending downward. So that's a good thing. That's something that we wanna see. Uh, so remember the main stresses right now in the system are due to uh, areas where case counts are rising, uh, especially in large urban centers, right? But right now for the time being, our case counts are dropping and that's a good thing. I just wanna tell you a little bit about vaccines. So there's a large discussion around vaccines and where they should be allocated and who should they go to, et cetera. I just wanted to remind you the, of the way that I think about this in case it's helpful, um, which is that really, 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 you know, to me, our first priority should be to use the vaccines to reduce population level deaths. Okay, that that there's really excellent evidence that the vaccines reduce severe hospitalization and death in people who are vaccinated. And so when you look at the people who are at the greatest risk of death at the population level, this is an old graph that I showed you uh, um, many months ago, but the point I think is still incredibly valid, which is that this gray line here is the case fatality rate in Ontario. That is the average. But you can see how much the average is pulled up by the 70 to 79 year old age group and the 80 plus age group. These age groups have a dramatically increased risk of death if they get COVID compared to the general population, which I would characterize as down here, okay? This this group is in the middle, I would say intermediate risk, right? This is the 60 to 69 year old age group. So if your priority is to reduce population level death, you start here, you work your way down because these people, when you immunize them, are gonna give you the greatest reductions in the, the risk of death, okay. That's what we've done, right? So, so we started with the 80 pluses, then we moved to the 70 to 79s. Now we're into the 60 to 69s. And those folks should be, you know, they're coming through our system uh, already, but certainly over the next few weeks, they're coming in through our system to be immunized. The second discussion happens down here, if you can see my little pointer which is all of these groups, I would say, are clustered together. You could make an argument that 50 to 59 is still a little bit higher than these groups and needs to be prioritized. But, but in general, these groups, I would say, form a cluster. That is to say that people down here who might have a chronic condition, uh, you know, that might elevate your risk above, above the average group. People who are here who don't have any chronic conditions and who are quite, you know, who are fairly uh, healthy, that might reduce your risk. So now we're talking about small differences in risk, okay, and, and people are making arguments about who should be prioritized based on their, their theoretical risk or their theoretical exposure. So to my mind, this is the second priority for vaccines, which is to think about using them to mitigate exposure risk. That is to take the people who are most at risk because they are either in an essential function uh, or have to conduct uh, in-person activities uh, to mitigate any risk that might come from that exposure. Remembering that overall, these people are still at far lower risk of death and hospitalization than any of these people up here, okay? And there's emerging evidence that that is possible. There's emerging evidence that, um, you know, widespread population coverage, uh, either in groups like that to mitigate exposure risk or at the level of the population uh, can actually reduce the burden of disease. We don't, we can't go so far yet to say that it interrupts transmission, but I think we can say that it interrupts, it, it reduces the overall burden of disease. So finally, the overall priority is really sufficient overall coverage in all of the age groups to reduce mortality, burden of disease, and over time, if we can get that evidence, prevent transmission and outbreaks. And there's some emerging evidence that that might be true. So if I, if I were to just give you a, a brief overview of what the vaccine rollout currently is, right? In terms of reducing outcome risk, we've hit a plateau on our 70 plus age groups. Um, they're no longer booking in um, and we're doing some work to identify what the coverage is on that, but I'm estimating it's at least 80%, which is good. We've got our 60 pluses booking and, and getting appointments now, and we're projecting that that will plateau somewhere in mid-May in terms of their numbers. We're moving to phase two congregate settings in those sectors. We've started bringing those people in, and so the other age groups are going to fill in over time. 
Population coverage is going to take some time to achieve substantial coverage, but again, I think we're making good headway. We're still focused on equity by, by having an urban and rural and mobile kind of clinic delivery model so that it, we can be reaching different parts of the county. Um, we're working to reduce transportation barriers. So you might have seen an announcement from, I think it was Leo in the Red Cross, enabling people over 50 uh, who don't have transportation to get transportation to a clinic, um, as well as working with transit systems to change their routes to make sure that our, our clinic clinics are accessible. Um, and of course, there's two mechanisms of booking. Lots, we're trying to make it as easy as possible for people to book by themselves, but of course, we can assist with the booking process for people who are unable to do so online. And, and um, when our numbers update today, we're going to be um, I believe we're going to be over 40,000 doses that have been administered, which I think is a good uh, a good milestone to hit. And, and we're just going to keep hitting more as we go forward, which is encouraging. So I'll stop sharing my screen. I know that's been a lot of information. I'll confirm that you can see me again. OK, um, and, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. OK, questions for Dr. Renaday. Uh, Councillor Bird and then Councillor B. Thank you. To the Chair, to Dr. Renaday, good morning. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I've had a question from many of the uh, constituents here have been calling me with a question over, say, the last six months, which I have tried to find the answer to myself, but no luck yet. So I'm hoping you can throw some kind of light on this one. So the question is this. When all those receiving a vaccination have to sign a consent form, why has the federal government granted the vaccine producing companies total immunity from liability if something goes wrong with their vaccine? I think that, Councillor, I think that's probably a question that's outside of my um, ability to answer. I, I don't know much about the details of whether or not the federal government has offered liability protection or any any of that sort of thing. Might be best directed to our federal um uh, representative. Okay, many thanks. I did have difficulty trying to find it. As I said, I, I looked up all this information, so I'll follow that up. Thank you. Hey, Councillor Bean. Through the chair to Dr. Renaday, um, you were talking about the mobile clinics um, reaching out to the older age. I heard the other day that there's not enough money to keep that up and running. Is that correct? Uh, I'm so, Councillor. I'm not aware of that issue. Um, to my knowledge, the only thing that's stopping us from doing those clinics is vaccine supply. So um, I know that we're booking out all those congregate other the other congregate settings like well into May because of our projected vaccine supply, um, but not aware of any issues related to the funding of that program or the ability to, to deliver it. I think we're still okay from what I know, but. You want to follow up? Yes, yes, please. Uh, yeah, I heard from a 78-year-old that's in a wheelchair, assisted living, uh, had a, was called with an appointment booked but couldn't make it, and she was trying to get them to come to her, and she was told that they couldn't go because it was no longer funded. I can follow up with you later on that if you'd like. That might be that might be best so that we can look into it a little bit more because I've not heard anything about funding issues. It may be a scheduling issue, but we can but we do have mobile teams that are working to do that work. So yeah. Okay. Any other questions for Dr. Renate? Uh Warden Marriott. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Jackie to Dr. Renaday. Uh, Dr. Renaday, you said we were at 40,000 immunizations so far, which that puts us close to 40%. Um, what is the number again that they figure is herd immunity? Is it 60 or 80%? So thanks, Councillor. Again, it's a warden. Um, it's a um, it's a rough estimate of at least 70 percent but but i think the bigger thinking is the lo the more coverage the better now that is provided that the vaccine can interrupt transmission so you cannot achieve herd immunity if the vaccine does not interrupt transmission as we find out more information about the vaccine's ability to interrupt transmission the concept of herd immunity will become either more or less relevant Um, I had a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Warden Marriott. 
Did you have a follow up? Yeah, if I could. Um, so, Doctor, the if we're at forty thousand, so how many a week are we doing still in Lapton? So, because um, I know there was some pressure to to go to uh, hot spots, but obviously we're still um, you're on a reduce scale, I believe. But just wondered uh, how many a week that you're able to do the last week. Thank you, Warden. So um, we so so first of all, I'll say, you know, right now we're in a position where whatever we get, we can use it fairly quickly. Um, I would say that our our reduced model of operation has largely to do with the fact that our vaccine has been stable, but we've been able to do more in a given day with our high volume clinics. So where we were doing the same amount over four or five or six days, now we've been able to compress it into a few days, which leaves us the opportunity to have capacity to do more as more vaccine comes in, right? So um, right now we're doing about four to 5,000 a week, depending on what we get in from the province, um, and uh, which of course depends on what they get in from the federal government. Um, but we have the capacity to do more, uh, as, uh, even with the same sites that we operate, as well as moving into additional sites, we have the capacity to do more. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Knapper. Yes, I'm not sure if this is appropriate place to ask this or not, but I've been getting a lot of pressure from my local golf courses here and petitions and stuff going around. And uh, are you hearing anything that they can make a move on this? It seems to me that uh, they put up a pretty good argument that they're not uh, causing any of this thing. And I think it'd be a great thing for mental health to get the people out in the golf courses. I understood, I'm not sure if I've got this correct or not, but 22,000 rounds of golf or, or something like that, there hasn't been one case. And is it not time maybe uh, during this um, uh crucial time that we start rewarding people for for, uh, for, for uh, stepping up the plate and doing what's right and uh, get people out and uh, get their mind off it. Even I know uh, some of us can do the course in two hours and guys like Ian Bean probably takes four, but it would get your mind off the situation and, uh, you know, get moving. Is there anything on we can do as a municipality to, to move this forward? Uh, do you have any input into that? Um, Councillor, thank you. I, uh, I don't have input, but you may have input. And so I think it's very reasonable for you to, uh, as a group or as a council, county, et cetera, to, uh, you know, make recommendations. And, and my role would be to suggest to you what the evidence behind those recommendations might be. So, for example, I would say to you that if you were to say, um, we think golf courses can happen safely, I would suggest to you that that's largely true with two exceptions. Uh, one is activities in and around the clubhouse, which are largely social and therefore result in prolonged contact of duration, right? Uh, the other exception is uh, not within the golf course's control, but we have noted that there are people who will drive together. And so if you're gonna spend uh, a significant amount of time in the car together just to go outside and spend time distance, then you've kind of defeated that purpose. So, so, but, but those are the two exceptions, the two situations where I would say, um, you know, you could increase the risk of transmission, but by and large, uh, outdoor golfing where you can stay reasonably distant from the other people is very low risk. Could I just have a follow up on that, uh, Jackie? Uh, just has, has there been any cases, uh, contributed to golf courses in Lampton County that you're aware of? Uh, uh, I hear all this hearsay, and I guess I'd like to hear from you. Have so, we had any cases? Yes, Councillor. To my knowledge, we have had, and they have been a result of the situations that I just described, which is interactions in the clubhouse and uh, um, people driving collectively to, to the site. Okay. Um, Councillor Weber, you had a question? Uh, yes, uh, thanks, uh, Chair, through to Dr. Vanity. Uh, the people that are, are like, we've gotten lots of people for our vaccines that we're getting. What is the number of people, or do you have any idea on the ones that say, no, I'm not taking a vaccine, I don't want it, the anti-vaxxers are, are, is that going to be an issue? And how do we uh, get the message out? I know they're talking on, uh, uh, national television about how do we get people to uh, make sure that they get the vaccine so everyone can get it. Um, 
Thanks, Council. It's a good question. Um, <clears throat> so here's what I would say in general right now. In general right now, the issue is more vaccine anxiety than vaccine hesitancy. Right now, more people want the vaccine and it's not available than the people who are saying they don't want it. And certainly for anyone who says they don't want it, we've got two or three people who want it. And so we're in, you know, so, so that's right now. As you move through the population and get way, way more coverage, you are going to see, um, uh, you know, more issues with people saying, I don't want it or I don't want this particular one or that kind of thing, right? And so, um, th there are a couple of strategies to address it. One is to wait actually until steady state and find out what that proportion was and then have specific targeted interventions for the reasons why people are choosing not to. And one of the most effective ways to shape that conversation is to have it through a trusted healthcare provider, somebody who knows you very well, someone who knows your history, who has the, the time to be able to sit there and talk to you about the, the you know, the different um, concerns that you have, and then to make a recommendation with you about how to move forward. We can't really get to that place where that activity could happen until um, we're more in a steady state where more routine vaccine is being delivered through uh, healthcare providers and where we're not so focused on getting lots of numbers done very quickly. So once you move the focus to there's lots of people immunized and now we're trying to immunize, you know, just create more baseline immunity, you can move to those kinds of interventions. The other piece at the population level that I would say we have a few resources to be able to do, but we're largely focused on um, uh, grabbing and and uh, adapting from other resources that are already available is public communications around vaccines and, and to address issues like, um, you know, uh, do they affect your DNA and that kind of thing. And so we've got FAQs on our getthevaccine.ca site, but also, you know, as we roll through, we'll be working on uh, specific um, communications related to specific issues as, as we see them. Um, but largely remember there's like kind of two or three groups of vaccine hesitancy that I would I would propose, right? One is, I don't want anything to do with vaccines. Uh, I never have and I never will. That's going to be a hard sell. That's going to be very challenging to get to that group as it always is, right? There's a few other groups that I would say have more movability. One is, I, I'm supportive generally about vaccines, but I have concerns about these vaccines. So that's something that we're, we're going to be more likely to be able to address. And uh, within the frame of COVID vaccines, people who have concerns about one or the other. And those two groups are easier to address because um, you're not dealing with a lot of other layers in terms of belief in vaccines or right, uh, acceptability of science, et cetera. So, um, you know, I think we kind of have a handle on how to do it, but I think moving through doing that is, uh, is a, a little bit of a later stage when we've gone through a lot of the immunizations of people who want them. Okay, thank you. Just Do you have a follow-up? Uh, it's, it's kind of a follow-up, but I guess it's it's also something different. Uh, it goes back to what uh, Councillor Knapper spoke of with the rules coming from the province. Uh, uh, I think all heads of council received a notice that there was going to be a a meeting with the uh, Auditor General and, and the Premier on Tuesday, and then we got an announcement that it's been moved to Friday now. So I guess those are questions uh, regarding the golf courses that maybe we'll get more direction of as we go through uh, from the province. Uh, I know they're, uh, they're having a hard time deciding what the regulations are for everything, and uh, hopefully we'll have more information on Friday, which again is doesn't give a municipality any time to adjust or to close a playground or open or do any of those things before the weekend. And it's, uh, again, very disappointing that those things aren't happening earlier on so that we can have adjustments made. And just my event, I'm sorry, I don't know if there's any response to that or not, but hopefully we'll find out more on the regulations on Friday. Thank you. I, yeah, I, normally I wouldn't respond to, to that. I think the only the only piece I would add to that is that, you know, as part of um, any advocacy that you do as a group, as a council around restrictions, you know, it's it's there's there's um, it's possible or, you know, you might also want to add in advocacy around uh, timing and notifications and planning. Right. So to say that, you know, the you know, there's a minimum amount of time that that municipalities need in order to implement the the kinds of restrictions or things that you that the province is going to put in place and so um having that request through the same advocacy channel would be reasonable good points 
Yeah. Yes. Just a yeah, final comment, I guess, ah. is that last Friday at four o'clock was the last announcement that was made and it was completely, how do you close a playground? How do you do this and the OPP? Like it was, uh, that's just, that has to stop. And I, we have to advocate for something better on that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hand. I'm just gonna um, add on to that. So on Friday, we get the word that, um, I said we're a very small municipality. You get the word you have to close the playground. So we had a staff work all day Friday, sorry, excuse me, Saturday to close the playgrounds. Saturday night, as he's finishing, we get the change in order to reopen. Well, we didn't reopen till Monday because we don't have staff on Sunday. And I got a call at home, like, didn't I know that the regulations changed? And I said, yes, but we had somebody work all day Saturday, so we'll wait till Monday to reverse it. So that was their notice period. All right. Um, we're going to take one more question for Dr. Renaday and from Councillor Knapper, and then we're going to let him get on with his day. Um, Councillor Knapper. Yeah, just to follow up on that, I, I know uh, the nursing homes have the same problem. Uh, like they get the announcement at 430 and all their staff is gone and you got all these people calling them and to make the changes and stuff. It's just on time. That's got to stop. And I, I feel for staff like, you know, they do the best they can. And uh, I think maybe the county should uh, should weigh in on this a little bit, uh, maybe through Jane or somebody and, uh, you know, say, hey, look, give us a break here and, and give us a chance to get things done. That's just my comment. I'm done for the day. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Dr. Renaday. We are uh, all hoping that the federal and provincial government can get us more vaccines because I know we do have the capacity to distribute those. And the sooner we can get them into arms, the better. So thank you very much for all you're doing. And we'll let you go for the day. And we'll continue on with Committee AM. Thank you. All right, everyone, we are going to start with the infrastructure and development services. There's some correspondence to receive and file. And one has a looks like there's a follow up or a motion that goes with that correspondence. How does Council want to deal with that? Councillor Veen. Uh, receive and file, I guess the uh, A anyway. Okay. And that's seconded by Councillor Weber. Any questions or comments on that? All in favor? That is carried. And then there's the letter from Anne Marie Nario, regional clerk from Niagara Region. Uh, uh, Councillor Bird. Thank you. <clears throat> Through the chair to everybody. Um, further to the request from the Niagara Regional Council. I move that we pass a supporting resolution rebuild 197, wherein the host municipalities now be empowered to render the final approval for landfills within their jurisdiction instead of the adjacent municipalities. This has been going on for so long, so I, I definitely support this and move that we pass the supporting resolution, please. Is there a seconder to that? I don't see a seconder, so do we have a motion to receive and file that? Wow. Uh, Councillor Beans? Councillor Weber, are you seconding that? Or would you like to speak to it? You're, mu uh, you're muted, Councillor Weber. I'll second it, uh, but I'd like to speak to it, I guess. Yes. Uh, so the way I understand it is uh, the host municipality gets the chance to approve or with this, but neighboring municipalities, it eliminates the, uh, um, where did I read it here? It eliminates the development approval requirement from adjacent municipalities. So someone can approve a landfill site on your border and the neighboring municipality doesn't get an opportunity. I guess that's why I didn't support the original motion. 
I think a neighboring municipality should have the right to speak to something that's on your boundary. So uh, I'm for tabling this or receiving and violence. Receiving and violence. I know that of a one circumstance where the one municipality has the right to approve it, but it's like right close to a city that is in a neighboring municipality. So it would impact that neighboring municipality much greater than the municipality who has the right to receive, to receive the landfill. The yeah. impacts would be much, much larger and the tipping fees would go to the host municipality and not to the neighboring municipality. So it makes it very challenging, I think. So I think that's where the committee is looking at it. So um, I'll, all in favor of receiving and filing that. That is carried, thank you. And then we have C, a letter, I believe, a letter from Tipu, I'm, I'm gonna butcher that name, Assistant Deputy Minister and Chief Emergency Management Ministry of Solicitor Gen General. So we're looking for a motion to receive and file that as well. Moved by Councillor Weber, seconded by Councillor Knapper, all in favor. That is carried. And we're gonna go down to B. There's a couple of correspondence from member municipalities, or one. Do we have a mover and a seconder for that? I, it looks to me like they're asking for support for the two motions. Um, Councillor Weber, are you moving to support that? Yes. And Councillor Knapper, are you seconding that? Any discussion on that? Councillor Veen, and or sorry, Councillor Veen, and then Councillor Weber. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I like A, but. I, I don't think we need to make it a four-way stop. I, I, you know, if you increase the size of the stop signs and you put the flashing lights on it, that should do it, I would think. And and I, I don't see why you'd want to make it a four-way stop. Hey, okay, um, Councillor Weber, did you have a comment before I go uh, to yes. the uh, Yeah, through you, I, I would just ask uh, uh, Mr. Cole what, the the thoughts are on on the rationale for this and whether it's uh, meets the standards in the book five or book fifteen whatever that roadway book says. Thank you. I was thinking the same thing, uh, Mr. Cole. Would you like to respond to that? Sure. Uh, uh, through you, Chair Rambouts. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Yeah. So. Um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, any time that we would consider intersection improvements, we would want to do it through the appropriate provincial standards. Um, uh, just uh, specifically for the Kimball Road um, and Petrolia Line intersection, uh, we have other improvements that need to happen there as part of the oversized load corridor. Uh, as you'll recall recently, we considered whether or not to implement a roundabout at that location, and, and um, that was deferred at this time. But as a result, that means that uh, there's an existing overhead flasher at that site, and it's, it has to something has to be done with it in order to accommodate the oversized loads at that intersection. So um, considering uh, uh, an intersection review study to, to see what options we have available and coming back with recommendations, uh, I think is, is uh, reasonable, and we wouldn't recommend something. If a four-way stop was warranted, we'd include that in, in, in our consideration. Um, and maybe I'll just ask, um, I, th I think I've covered that off fully, and, and, but I, I might want to just ask Matt DeLine if there's anything else to add to that. No, not at this time. Um, the other intersection down at Courtright Line and Kimball is also addressed in this uh, resolution from St. Clair Township Council. Um, and I guess that would be the one where that would require uh, direction if we have kind of responded to the Petroleum Line and Kimball intersection, I guess it would be the next one that would require. So where do we go from here if we do pass this resolution? Does that bring on a report from to go to council or how does that work? Um, yeah, I, I think uh, I, 
I think given the uh, request that uh, we can do an intersection review and uh, come back with recommendations for that intersection. Uh, Councillor Han, did you have a comment? Unmute. Sorry, you're muted. Sorry, I was going to suggest that it goes forward to uh, the roads committee, the roads group for review. Then it would go back to council. Would that not be the order? Okay. So in passing this, it will spark that process then. Uh, Councillor Knapper. Yeah, you know, what's the time frame on this? I know we've had studies out there on on road for years and years, and it never seems to come back. So let's let's put a time frame on this. This municipality is coming asking a request. They put a lot of time in looking at that, and they know best what goes on in their municipalities. And I have trouble uh, dragging it out. And uh, uh, like, is this at least make it a priority? Because there've been a lot of serious actions and stuff out there. I think anyway, but others don't. But I. Uh, I just like to see a time frame put on this thing. Uh, just don't study, 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 study all the time. I don't like them. I'll just get some action. Uh, Councillor Hand. I, I just wanted to um, mention to um, Councillor Knapper that there's new information because of the, the corridor work. So it's not a matter of not moving forward. It's the corridor work is going to involve making changes to it. So it's new information. Um, Mr. Cole, can you give us the timeline that we're looking at? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we need to get this. We the, Certainly the Kimball and Petroleum one, uh, uh, we need to address that so that any improvements can be implemented within our funding envelope. So uh, we would want to act quickly on this, and we would want to have something resolved and, and, and uh, hopefully recommendations, um, you know, within the summer timeline. So it, it, this, I don't think this is a matter of um, doing some of the larger studies we, we've needed to do. We're not going out and looking at whether or not a roundabout's being implemented here. Uh, it's a smaller scale. And, and, and to be fair, uh, those types of studies uh, did take uh, more to, you know, th those types of things needed surveys and, uh, uh, and uh, collection of, of um, traffic data that we didn't have. And uh, so in this case, I, I you know, uh, seeing something come back this summer would be reasonable. We do, however, though, have to get a consultant on board to to take a look at it, scope the work out, and and uh, make sure that they have time to review it in in a full and complete fashion. Any other comments before we proceed with the vote? All in favor? That is carried. Thank you. So we'll move down to information reports. There's several there, so I don't know how the committee wants to deal with those. Did you want to deal with those all at once, uh, Councillor Hand, or all together? I was thinking it would be reasonable to do the four together. Okay. Do we have a seconder to that? A to uh, D. Councillor Bean. And does anyone want to speak to any of those reports before we move? those. All in favor of receiving and filing those reports. That is carried. Um, Mr. Cole, did you have any comments? Sorry. Oh, uh, no, through you, uh, Chair. Um, I, I think the reports were well presented. Yes. It's always a good uh, sign when you have them go through quickly. So we're going to move down to public health service, or is there any other business? Um, Councillor Hand, you're muted. It looks to me like you're... Sorry, Councillor Rombots, we, the, there's a report requiring a motion. Oh, thank you so health. much. Sorry. Yes, yeah, there is. Thank you. Um, Councillor Beans, are you moving that report? Yes, I am. Okay. And do we have a seconder to that? Councillor Hand? Any questions or comments on that report? All in favor? That is carried. Thank you. Is there any other business before we move on? 
Seeing none, we are going to go down to public health services. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Uh, we have some correspondence to receive and file. We have a mover. Uh, Councillor Veen, do you want to move the, to receive and file all of that correspondence? Yes, please. Thank you. And you seconded that, Councillor Miller? Any questions or comments on any of those, uh, or, uh, any of that correspondence? All in favor? That is carried. We have an information report dated April 21st regarding COVID-19 activities. Just need a motion to receive and file that report. Uh, moved by Councillor Weber, seconded by Councillor Hand. Any questions or comments on that report? All in favor. That is carried. Uh, we have a report requiring a motion on the grant funding for older adult care pathways development. So moved. Thank you, Councillor Weber and Councillor Hand. Questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor. That is carried. Thank you. Mr. Taylor, you got off easy today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, emergency, we're going to move on to emergency medical services department. There's an information report there. Um, Councillor Beans and Councillor Miller. Any questions or comments on that report? All in favor of receiving and filing. That is carried. And there's a report requiring a motion for community paramedic medicine in long-term care funding. Councillor Beans, are you moving that? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you. Do we have a seconder to that? Councillor Bird. Any questions or comments on that report? All in favor. That is carried. And we're going to move on to Cultural Services Division. There is an information report on the status of operations for Cultural Services Division. We need a mover and a seconder to receive and file that report. Moved by Councillor Miller, seconded by Councillor Hand. Questions or comments on that report? Uh, Councillor Knapper. Yeah, that's my my complaint I make every time. When's Ken Lackey going to get even groups I pick up? I didn't see it in there. Mr. Meyer? Through you, Chair Robert, thanks again for the question, uh, Councillor Knapper. And uh, we are still um, holding to our existing 16 locations for curbside pickup. And in Plimpton, Wyoming, that includes uh, the Wyoming branch at this time. Um, so hopefully, hopefully in the future we can open up um, Cam Lackey as well for other services. But at this time, we're we're just maintaining the 16 sites. Follow up, please. Yes. Have you noticed that there's quite an influx of people out there now, and it's getting to be a quite a large area? And uh, I get requests every day from people coming in there wanting to know when that's going to be restored. So I just ask you to move on it quickly rather than slowly and get these people off me. Me list. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there any other questions about that report? All in favor of receiving and filing? That is carried. Is there any other business for cultural services? Seeing none, we will move on. We have no in camera, so all we have left is adjournment. Moved by Councillor Beans. Seconded by Councillor Miller. All in favor. That is carried. Thank you very much. And okay. we will have a safe day. And Bill, don't go out making snowmen up there today. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty well all melted. There's that's all we got. <laughs> Stay safe, everyone. Take care. Bye. Take care, everyone.